4,000 miles away in Southeast Asia, along the southern leg of the Silk Road, another mysterious civilization has been challenging the historians. Towering above the jungle canopy of Cambodia, this was the crowning achievement of the Khmer people, who lived here at Angkor Wat between 800 and 1400 AD. It is an awe-inspiring sight, a vast, stunningly engineered temple complex, the largest religious monument in the world. But at its heart lies an enigma. The civilization that created it seemed to have come out of nowhere. There are few traces of what came before and few clues to the history of the Khmer people to whom we owe this remarkable place. Professor Charles Hyam has dedicated his professional life to answering the questions that hang over the Angkor civilization. There is so much to find out about Southeast Asia, but the dominance of the civilization of Angkor over so many centuries uh, is one of the things that attracts any archaeologist coming to Southeast Asia. The first visitors to this great city and, and, and temple of Angkor came in the 16th century and ever since Western people have been wanting to know about its origins. How did it happen? Who was responsible for these enormous monuments? And therefore my interest was trying to find the origins of it way back in the prehistoric past. One of the things that puzzles experts about this hauntingly magnificent complex is that although the Khmer people are unquestionably Southeast Asian, the temples at Angkor show clear signs of a completely different society one 2,000 miles and a cultural world away, India. The very center of the temple, with its enormous sandstone towers, was built to represent Mount Meru, the home of the Hindu gods and a sacred site in India. And the Indian influence is equally clear in the detailed artwork that covers the site. This is one of the best examples of the uh, stimulus provided by Indian epic literature upon the people of Angkor. The local people of Angkor picked up all these fantastic stories taken from the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, these epic Indian uh, literature, and they uh, produced here this great relief that extends over tens of meters on each direction. And essentially, this particular one depicts the churning of the ocean of milk, which was designed in order to generate from the oceans below the earth the elixir of immortality known as Amrita. It isn't just Hinduism that seems to have been an influence at Angkor. The temple at nearby Angkor Tom is decorated with hundreds of sculpted heads. But these figures echo another Indian religion, Buddhism. These images of Khmer kings reflect a strong identification with the Indian prophet, Buddha. Indian influence is something that's been dominant in trying to explain and understand this civilization. Looking around you at Angkor, you can't help but notice the extraordinary similarities that exist between the architecture, uh, the religion, the language, the script. Everything seems to come from India. And yet, uh, in fact, there is a very, very solid uh, local overlay. Uh, so the Indian influence comes in by all means, but it's molded, it's, it's adopted, it's used by the local people to their own advantage. And so forth, it's an interesting mixture that one is all constantly trying to unravel. The veneer of Indian culture over a solid local base is the sort of model that we're now working on and looking at. Clearly, the Khmer people had been in contact with Indian ideas and religion over many years. But how had such a powerful influence reached them from such a distance? We know that the Silk Road was never just one highway. There were numerous routes, not all of them on land. At about the time Angkor Wat was built, the Chinese were trade ilk with India along a southern sea route via Cambodia. 
They were using a sailing route that relied upon the monsoon winds to carry boats between India and Cambodia. Once in Cambodia, the Indian sailboats were marooned until the winds changed direction to blow them back to the subcontinent. The vagaries of the monsoon often kept the traders stranded for as long as six months at a time. So Cambodia became their second home, and Indian religion and culture began to take root in the region. Trade explained the Indian influence, but no one knew just when these contacts had begun. Did Indian traders arrive after the Angkor civilization was established, merely adding a veneer of Indian culture, or did they come far earlier, shaping and forming the entire Angkor civilization? Nobody knew. For Charles Hyam, it was a crucial question. He suspected that Indian trading was far older than we thought, reaching back before the time of Angkor Wat and the silk trade, and he began to look for proof. He was inspired by long-lost Chinese documents that had come to light early in the 20th century. They were detailed descriptions of a thriving Cambodian seaport and city called Funan. When it was visited by the Chinese in the 3rd century AD, Funan was said to be already trading with India and showing the marked influence of Indian culture and religion. The only problem was that Funan did not seem to exist. Scholars had found no signs of this culture, which would have predated Angkor Wat by more than 800 years. In the absence of any sign of the city itself, most scholars dismissed the Funan documents as a traveler's tale. But during the 1930s, a French geographer named Pierre Paris detected the outline of a man-made canal system in a coastal area of Cambodia called Angkor Borai. Follow-up work was interrupted by war, and it wasn't until 1995 that research at the site could begin. It was immediately clear that the canal system was well-planned and extensive, linking sea and the hinterland with an ancient settlement at Angkor Borai. At first, archaeologists had assumed that the canals were part of a rice irrigation system, but there was another possible explanation. Could these be the trading highways described by the Chinese nearly 2,000 years ago? Could Angkor Borai be the fabled lost city of Funan? Charles has come to Angkor Barai to meet Dr. Miriam Stark of the University of Hawaii, a colleague who has spent eight years working on the site. Hello, Charles. How are you? See you again. Nice to see you. How's it going? He has brought with him a translation of the original Chinese documents describing Funan to compare with what Dr. Stark's work has revealed at Angkor Barai. Miriam, I brought that the massive tome or tomes that you mentioned Excellent. and here we have the uh, description of Fu Le Funan by Paul Pellio's translation of the Chinese documents that was published precisely a hundred years ago. But he talked a lot about the moats and also about the wall that surrounded all of the kinds of uh, capitals and all the Funan cities and Angkor Barai here has still several remaining segments of the wall especially here along its eastern side. Yep. And is it your view that the uh, city here mm. would have been occupied in the 3rd century AD at the same time that the Chinese emissaries came down looking for a, an alternative maritime silk road? Oh yes, what's interesting about Angkor Bore is that actually the occupation starts in the 4th century BC. So Miriam's work has already established that there was a significant settlement here at the time that the Funan descriptions were written. Now her attention has turned to the waterway complex. Yeah. So, how's it going with the canals? You've been working on them now for some time, haven't you? We have, and the reason we have is because part of understanding this Funan is determining whether Funan really was a maritime trade-based empire that the historians think it was. If that's the case, then Angkor Barai could have been an inland capital that was sending goods down to the coast. Mm -hmm. So, 
One way to try to test that is to look at these ancient canals and to figure out how old they are and also whether they have the dimensions capable of uh, carrying boats that would have been loaded with provisions heading yeah. to the south. Surveying the huge and complicated Angkor Borai site is essential to the success of the research. Miriam has invited Charles to see for himself how this vital process is going. Today they're heading for an outlying area, accessible only by boat. It's a chance for Charles to see the canals at first hand. Uh, we'll probably go down this excavated canal, Rec Encore, and then drop down this way, I drop see. south. And that's and this way, is it over that's here? That's right. Okay. This is a new site, and to the untutored eye, it's just a field. But this is where years of training pay off. For archaeologists, the tiniest signs indicate what's hidden beneath the soil. A series of careful measurements confirm their first impressions. This is very exciting for me, not having been here before. Corner of the mud. Vertical angle is negative 1.5 degrees. Horizontal angle is 342 degrees and 10 minutes. Okay. When we got to this site three days ago, we saw that actually there's a complex of four separate mounds, each of which is surrounded by a moat. And in the center of three of the mounds, we also found remains of collapsed brick structures. Based on those brick structures, most of which were looted, and the recovery of ceramics, we think that the site could date between around A.D. 300 and 800. Again, the dates fit with the Chinese accounts of Funan. At another Angkor Burai site, where excavation is already advanced, the team have found some crucial new evidence that Charles is keen to see. And we were invited by the district to excavate a unit here. When we did that, we encountered an area here uh, of fill which seems older, perhaps uh, older than AD 500. And directly underneath there, we found a cemetery. The cemetery is obvious in this section because you can see bones sticking out of the section here and also here. We found several kinds of pottery throughout this whole sequence at the yep. top. We oh, had kendi. some fragments of kendi, yes. What do you think the kendi pottery is significant. It comes from Sri Lanka and is evidence of a long distance sea trade. Uh, the appearance corresponds with the appearance of Buddhism or some Indic religion in yep. Southeast Asia. So this came on the, on, on the heels of trade, basically. Everywhere that we see this along the coast of the South China Sea, we, we think that we've got evidence of interaction with South Asia. Yep. And so what about jewelry? Did you find any um, jewelry? We did find some. Uh, not so many stone beads, but we did find glass beads like oh these. Yes, yes these, these are almost identical with the ones that we find way up in uh, northeast Thailand. Uh, some technical studies that we've done recently suggest that the beads themselves may have been made in the Mekong Delta, but the remaining question is whether the glass was made in yep. the Mekong Delta or whether colour was brought in from South Asia, perhaps as ballast. Yes, it seems to me that uh, either way you've got definite uh, Indian influence coming in with glass. Here was the evidence that trade goods from India were commonplace at Angkor Barai at just the time reported for Funan. And the canals at Barai that so closely resemble those described for Funan? Miriam has been working on dating them too. Have you managed to date the canals yet? Well, we haven't dated this canal segment, but we have dated a short canal segment that runs from Angkor Bore down to Phnom Bore. And we found that its initial construction was around 2,000 years ago. And about 1,500 years ago, it seems to have filled up and no, people no longer used it. Well, that's perfect dating for Funan, isn't it? It is. And, and is it your the research has shown that Angkor Bore had been a thriving center, trading with India and beyond even before the third century AD. It's now almost certain that this was indeed the lost city of Funan and that this culture formed the foundation of the rich and complex Angkor civilization that followed.
For Charles Hyam, the importance of the trade links can't be overemphasized. The control of trade was absolutely vital. And this is probably why the earliest civilizations in Southeast Asia developed in coastal areas which were exposed to the initial arrival of the trade vessels and indeed the dispatch of trade goods to India and to China. And this allowed local rulers, local chiefs, who were already emerging and becoming more powerful and more wealthy, suddenly to enrich themselves uh, and, in, and, and, and gather together more followers and become more wealthy. And then, of course, all sorts of other things followed. For example, cities, taxation, uh, the development of uh, state religions, the adoption of more and more godlike features for these rulers. And the, the end product of all this was a site like Angkor. Historians are now absorbing the information that long-distance trade was occurring in this part of Asia about a thousand years earlier than they had thought. For along with the trade would have gone ideas and influences, a cultural melding from which great civilizations could emerge. The findings at Angkor Burai have put the clock back on contacts between India and Southeast Asia. But will historians have to revise their views about trade elsewhere in Asia? East and West, Constantinople, the modern Istanbul, was and is a natural crossroads, an ancient city straddling the Bosphorus Straits that divide Europe from Asia. Perfectly positioned, Constantinople became the hub of all the great trading routes, creating a glorious melting pot of cultural diversity and commercial acumen. By the 10th century AD, intercontinental trade had laid a firm foundation for what was later to become the Ottoman Empire. As far as historians were concerned, the blossoming of Constantinople was the beginning of long-distance communication in this part of the world. But 500 miles from the capital, in the stark tundra of Turkey's Anatolian steppe, one of the world's oldest cities has something new to reveal. Chattel Hoyuk dates from the dawn of human civilization. It's the earliest city ever discovered, the first evidence of people living in a large, settled group. Here, 9,000 years ago, there were streets and houses with decorated walls and ornaments. A team from England's Cambridge University is slowly uncovering the city. For archaeologist Shahina Farid, this evidence of community living is a turning point in human history. As a Neolithic site, the characteristics of um, Chattel Huk is that uh, it's one of the earliest sites when people settle down after a hunting gathering type livelihood and they settled down in one, one place, started building houses and taking advantage of their environment. The city was supported by farming and its people enjoyed a period of stability lasting many centuries. And they weren't just scraping a living. Skeletons buried beneath the houses revealed that these ancient city dwellers were well nourished and healthy, apparently prosperous. The community at Chatelhuk appeared to have done very well at this particular um, site. The site was populated and lived in for over a thousand years and if things hadn't been working for them they would certainly have moved on. So something was obviously keeping them at this particular spot. So what was the key to their success? 
How did they manage the transition from nomadic life at a time when other groups had failed? As they considered this question, archaeologists at the site began to discover something unusual. Hidden in walls and floors, they found caches of a remarkable substance. It was obsidian, a natural volcanic glass. The people of Chattel must have brought it from the now dormant volcanoes of the nearby Cappadocia mountain range. Extremely hard and sharp, obsidian was a precious commodity, a perfect material for making arrows, knives and even mirrors. The hidden caches of obsidian contained more than anyone could require for their own use. It looked as if the chattel people were dealing in obsidian, but who were they trading with? Dr. James Blackman works in a nuclear laboratory, but he is in fact an archaeologist with a special interest in obsidian. Archaeologically, obsidian is important because it was extensively traded throughout the uh, ancient Near East and it can be used to trace uh, exchange networks. There are only a limited number of sources for obsidian in the world. The people of Chattel had access to one of them. Yet in the last few years, archaeologists have been finding early obsidian artifacts in the Yemen and Iran, where no natural source exists. So where did that obsidian come from? I use chemistry of the material to trace the trade. The first thing you need to do is to have samples of, of obsidian. Once you've established the chemistry of the geological sources, you can then match the chemistry of the artifacts found in the various archaeological sites. And this is where the nuclear reactor comes in. Samples from all over the Middle East come to this laboratory where Dr. Blackman prepares them for chemical analysis. The samples are treated and passed into the nuclear reactor to be irradiated. The irradiated obsidian then begins to give off radioactive gamma rays that can be recorded and analyzed to give a chemical fingerprint for each sample. All samples from a particular source will share the same fingerprint. These chemical signatures allow Dr. Blackman to compare foreign samples with obsidian from Turkey. The results showed that the artifacts from Yemen and Iran could only have come from Turkish volcanoes. The central Anatolian Turkey sources have been found as far south as uh, the Levant and along the, the Euphrates River and as far east as uh, central uh, Iran uh, at a site called Tepe Yaya in south central Iran. Around volcanoes close to Chatalhoyuk, there's clear evidence that obsidian had been extracted and worked. It seems that the Chattel people were processing obsidian and sending it on the first leg of a lengthy trade route. Perhaps this control over a popular commodity had accounted for their prosperity. These were the very earliest human settlements, and already a trade network was reaching out beyond the immediate area. Historians had thought of the Silk Road as the earliest Asian trade route, but the Chattel Hoyuk evidence totally overturned that idea. For the obsidian traders were plying parts of the very same route 7,000 years earlier. It was a revelation. And there were more to come. Indus Valley, in modern-day Pakistan and northern India, lie the remains of the world's largest prehistoric civilization. More extensive than that of ancient Egypt, more sophisticated than anything that came before and much that came after, 
the Indus Valley cities reached their peak about 4,000 years ago, 5,000 years after Chatelhoi built. For the past 10 years, Dr. Mark Kinawa has been studying the Indus Valley site at Harappa. Excavations here have revealed a large, solidly built city. Its brick houses, complete with bathrooms and water systems, displaying technology not seen again until Rome 2,000 years later. This was a typical, prosperous, peaceful Indus Valley city, part of a pattern of closely linked settlements. The only way to really understand how they were integrated was, is through looking at their uh, technologies because the technologies were key to the, the movement across the Indus Valley and also the integration of those cultures. In his work at the site, Mark Kinoa has built up a picture of a skilled and sophisticated people. They used a standardized system of weights and measures and a writing system, one of the first, to tally their goods. It all pointed to trade. Yet the Harappans predated the supposed start of the Silk Road by 2,000 years. The key to Dr. Kenoa's latest research lies with these tiny stone beads. They are found throughout the Indus Valley, and similar ones have been found much further afield. Mark Kenoa began to work on ways of identifying the origin of the beads. For him, the key lay in the technology used to make them. In his laboratory in the US, he has built a replica of an ancient drill. This technique that I'm using here is based on a technique developed in the Indus Valley Civilization, so it, it, around 2600 BC. The uh, technique that I'm using here is using water to try to help uh, cool the bead as it's being drilled. This keeps it from cracking. And it also cools the drill itself because the drill it gets very hot. It also washes out the ground up bead material that you're drilling out of this uh, bead. One of the distinguishing features of beads is their technology in which they're made. So by comparing technologies, we can determine that beads that look the same are actually made in different places. And this is the, the result of looking at their drill holes and looking at specific aspects of the techniques used to manufacture them. Kinawa has learnt that drills are specific to certain areas and that each type leaves a different set of minute marks on the bead, a kind of trademark identifying where the bead was made. But these tiny marks are on the inside of the bead and so he fills the beads with a gel that takes a precise impression. The gel impressions provide a unique record of the hundreds of beads Kinoa has gathered from sites across the globe. And under a powerful microscope, Dr. Kinoa can determine precisely where each bead was made. And he's discovered that Harappan beads have been turning up in some very surprising places. By comparing the inside of the bead, meaning the drill hole, and the measurements and all of the, the specifics of it, it's possible now to confirm that beads made in the Indus Valley were going to Mesopotamia, they were going to Central Asia, and most recently I'm finding that there might be beads in China. Finding beads from the Indus Valley in China during the Western Zhou period um, you know, probably around uh, 1200 to um, 800 uh, BC. Um, this is Shang and Western Zhou. And it's very important. It's, it means that there's much wider overlapping trade networks in the ancient period than anyone had ever imagined. The Turkish obsidian findings had shown that there was trade across parts of Asia 9,000 years ago. But the Harappan bead evidence proves that by 4,000 years ago, there was trade right across Asia, 2,000 years before the Silk Road had begun. It looks as if the history books had it wrong, and that moreover, trade contacts had been part and parcel of the growth of ancient civilizations. It's a breakthrough in our knowledge of Asian history, and to Mark Kinoa, it makes perfect sense. 
The emergence of early civilizations could not have occurred without trade. You cannot develop a complex society without connections to distant areas. Trade is key to bringing materials in from distant areas that are not accessible to everyone in that society. The emergence of hierarchical society, classes, different classes of society, is based on some people getting certain materials and other people not getting it. So trade is essential for helping to create hierarchy and differences within a society. Evidence was mounting to show that established trading links must have existed from earliest times. But many historians still held to the idea that only the goods had moved along the chain. The people and their cultures stayed separate. The next breakthrough was to come from a desolate area very near to where those tiny Harappan beads ended their journey, in Xinjiang province, China. This is the Taklamakan Desert in the westernmost part of China, a vast desert of sand and stone rimmed by impassable mountains. To the south are the slopes of the Himalayas and Tibet, to the north, the frozen wastes of Mongolia and the Gobi Desert. Taklamakan is hardly welcoming, frozen in winter and burning in summer. Yet cities such as Zhaohuo, Subashu and Lulan, now ruins in the sand, once bustled with life. For these were the staging posts in the Silk Road stopovers where traders took refuge and exchanged their goods. When the silk traders crossed the Taklamakan, they linked the people and cultures of East and West for the first time, or so historians had thought. But on the edge of the Taklamakan, tucked away in a little visited Tarim Basin Museum, was a discovery that would change all of that. Not the deliberately prepared mummies of Egyptian fame, but ancient corpses, naturally preserved by the dehydrating desert climate. Such mummies are not uncommon in desert areas, but these were so unexpected. A complex society without connections to distant areas, trade is key to bringing materials in from distant areas that are not accessible to everyone in that society. The emergence of hierarchical society, classes, different classes of society, is based on some people getting certain materials and other people not getting it. So trade is essential for helping to create hierarchy and differences within a society. Evidence was mounting to show that established trading links must have existed from earliest times. But many historians still held to the idea that only the goods had moved along the chain. The people and their cultures stayed separate. The next breakthrough was to come from a desolate area very near to where those tiny Harappan beads ended their journey, in Xinjiang province, China. This is the Taklamakan Desert, in the westernmost part of China, a vast desert of sand and stone rimmed by impassable mountains. To the south are the slopes of the Himalayas and Tibet, to the north the frozen wastes of Mongolia and the Gobi Desert. Taklamakan is hardly welcoming, frozen in winter and burning in summer. Yet cities such as Zhaohuo, Subashu and Lulan, now ruins in the sand, once bustled with life. For these were the staging posts in the Silk Road, stopovers where traders took refuge and exchanged their goods. When the silk traders crossed the Taklamakan, they linked the people and cultures of East and West for the first time, or so historians had thought. But on the edge of the Taklamakan, 
tucked away in a little visited Tarim Basin Museum was a discovery that would change all of that. Mummies. Not the deliberately prepared mummies of Egyptian fame, but ancient corpses naturally preserved by the dehydrating desert climate. Such mummies are not uncommon in desert areas, but these were so unexpected they sent shock waves through the archaeological world. Their features reflect not the Asian people who inhabit this continent today, but a completely different physical type. Some of these bodies are more than six feet tall, much taller than the norm for the local Chinese population. Their desiccated remains reveal wisps of blonde hair, high cheekbones, long prominent noses, and round, deep-set eyes. None of these is characteristic of Asian peoples. They are typically Caucasian. It looked as if these were visitors from outside, travelers who had died thousands of miles from their original home. The mummies provoked a whole raft of questions. Why were these people so different to today's Asian population? Who were they and where had they come from? There was one clue. The mummies were dressed in colorful clothing and wrapped in cloth. Irene Good is a textiles expert from Harvard University. She was invited by the Chinese authorities to take fabric samples for analysis. In her laboratory, she carried out a meticulous examination. First, she looked at the designs, patterns, and weaving techniques, comparing them with those known to have been used throughout history by different cultures. I was seeing design styles and motifs that were actually influences from areas that we think of uh, as quite divergent and far away, namely uh, these uh, tartans or plaids that may have appeared to be what we are familiar with from uh, Iron Age Europe, Northern Europe. Then she moved on to the fibers themselves. Advanced techniques enabled her to pin down the original source of the materials. She's helped by the fact that most of the cloth is wool. There are a number of different diagnostic features of animal fibers that can be used to identify the animal from which it came, namely the, the diameter of the fiber, the shape of it in cross-section, the type of scale, the shape of the scale, and how it's arranged on the shaft of the fiber, and also the level of waviness or kinkiness to the fiber. Under the powerful gaze of a scanning electron microscope, the shape and structure of each fiber becomes crystal clear. From this detailed picture, Irene can go on to identify the species of sheep that a fiber has come from. Analyzing her results, Irene soon realized that the wool of the mummy's clothes came from a sheep that could not have been found in China at that time. Culturally, China was not involved with wool production or use until considerably later. Um, the wools that were used by the mummies in the Tarim Basin, some of them were related to sheep and therefore of people that had a common ancestor at least to ones that were used in Europe. So it's almost certainly coming in from, from the West. If these were the mummies of visitors from the West, it was vitally important to know just when they had arrived. Could they really be as old as they seemed? In the laboratory, radiocarbon dating techniques were able to provide the answer. These people died about 4,000 years ago, almost 2,000 years before the Emperor Xin opened up the Silk Road. The presence of the mummies meant that there had been Western visitors in this remote part of China many centuries before we thought, proving that it wasn't only trade goods that had made the journey across Asia. And clearly the Silk Road traders were not breaking new ground, but following in the footsteps of their much earlier ancestors. 
The work at Petra and Angkor Wat showed how far-reaching and diverse the effects of trade can be. Now historians are accepting that very similar influences must have been stimulating cultures across Asia at least 4,000 years ago and possibly earlier. So the great civilizations of Asia had not grown up in isolation. The threads of trade had joined them from earliest times. Suddenly we're looking at an exchange of ideas, knowledge and culture that we never suspected. East and West may well have more of a common history than either have imagined. <laughs>